hi to California, hi to Lithuania, hi to London, and hi to Pennsylvania. Hi everyone, and welcome again to this Hyperledger in-depth member webinar with Kaleido on tokenizing assets at institutional scale. Uh, we'll get started in just a couple of minutes, just to give more people a chance to join. Welcome everybody, and for those of you that joined uh, before my last check-in, I also invite you to use the chat button, uh, say hello, and tell us where you're zooming in from. Hi to Turkey, Germany, and India. Welcome, happy to have you. All right, so we are gonna get started. Uh, hello everybody again, and uh, happy to have you. Welcome to this Hyperledger in-depth webinar with Kaleido on tokenizing assets at institutional scale uh, with Kaleido and Hyperledger Technologies. We're delighted uh, to share this new webinar with you. Um, and my name is Tomas, and I'm an ecosystem manager at the Hyperledger Foundation. And it's great to see everybody here, including our panelists, who I will introduce in just a moment. Today, as usual, and if you have attended any of the previous member webinars, um, you know that we have some housekeeping. So first of all, I would like to say that oh, everybody is welcome in our Hyperledger community and that we are striving to create a welcoming environment for everybody. So please follow our code of conduct when interacting with other participants of the webinar and broader in our community as well. And you can find our code of conduct on our website and on our wiki. Now, all the Hyperledger foundations are held under the uh, Linux antitrust policy, and you can find that on our website and on our wiki as well. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available for you to review later in our webinar library as well as on our YouTube channel. So if you miss something, you're always welcome to go back and check it out there. Um, and the slides will also be uh, downloaded. Uh, it will be able for download in our webinar library. This meeting is also being live streamed on YouTube and LinkedIn Live and welcome to everybody joining us there as well. Now we like to encourage these webinars to be as active as possible. So if you have a question or a comment, uh, please feel free to use the raise, raise hand function and we will unmute you and you can ask your question to the speakers. You can use also the Q&A box uh, as well as the chat button uh, to uh, ask your questions. And for those of you joining on LinkedIn Live and YouTube, uh, feel free to use the comment box to ask your questions there. And you know we would really encourage you to uh, be as active and ask as many questions as you would like, because the more participation we will have, the better experience for everybody. Uh, for those of you that have questions that don't get answered, we will also share our Discord channel as well as the contact of our uh, member company Kaleido, so you can contact them directly as well. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Lana and Nick. Uh, Lana is a, a principal architect of digital assets at Kaleido, and Nick is a solutions architect at Kaleido. So uh, Nick and Lana, uh, over to you. Thanks, Tomas. Really appreciate it. Um, and, and thanks to Hyperledger and all the attendees for uh, the participation today. Um, as, as Tomas said, um, I'm an architect at Kaleido. Um, I've been involved in the Hyperledger community for about eight years, seven and a half, eight years now, uh, spanning from a previous career at IBM, where we worked very closely with the Hyperledger Fabric Protocol. Uh, since then, we've remained very active in the Hyperledger community contributing to repositories like Hyperledger Besu. We seeded the code base for Hyperledger Firefly and are very active uh, inside of that community. Uh, so you'll see um, some glimpses of both of those protocols and node clients today, uh, as well as a great glimpse of Hyperledger Firefly. So um, excited to be here. Uh, welcome to everyone. And um, I'd reiterate what Tomas said. Um, please don't be shy. Any questions, raise your hand, use the chat. Uh, we love interaction. So 
Um, welcome, over to you, Lana. Awesome, thank you for having us. Um, so my name is Lana Kalashnik. I'm a principal architect and I focus on financial institutions and digital assets at Kaleido. So I've been in the blockchain space for quite some time, it's going about um, eight years now. And during this time, we've accumulated quite a lot of um, knowledge and little nuggets uh, that we've been collecting over time that we want to sh share with you. Um, prior to uh, joining Kaleido, I uh, led venture building at FAS. Um, which is um, a great company for building out financial products. So we focused on digital assets there. And prior to that, um, I was the global technology lead for the blockchain segment and Amazon Web Services. So had quite a lot of um, experience building companies and helping customers kind of grow their footprint and their use cases um, based on Hyperledger products. Um, so thanks for having us. I'm going to go ahead and share the slides. So we're going to go over just a few. Um, I wanted to share some of the um, some of the things that I've learned over the last um, eight years or so. Um, and then we're going to go through a demo of actually showing how you can think about the space, how tokenization um, enables new use cases. Um, in my case, for financial companies, but not necessarily. So this... Um, these technologies are pretty broadly applicable to um, to um, to a lot of these cases. All right, this is us. So um, a little bit about Kaleido. So we've been around for a few years now. So it's going on to year six. And during this time, we worked with uh, global leaders in multiple industries. Um, so uh, standing up consortia is something that is not um, traditionally easy to do. However, we've combined our open source product along with, with the Kaleido platform to automate a lot of the functions that used to take a lot of time. Um, today, we're gonna to be talking mostly about how do you move from consortia or from your test blockchain networks to tokenizing assets. And when we mean assets, there are multiple definition of what an asset could mean. So for somebody, let's say from Shell, an asset could be a barrel of oil versus somebody who is working in capital markets, this could be a different um, asset type. So for us, it's just a representation of financial asset or an asset that is kind of reflected on chain. And one of the examples that I like to bring up is our work with SWIFT. So SWIFT is a, um, is a global leader in relaying transactional data between multiple countries, multiple jurisdictions, and so on. So it was really interesting to trial um, a new CBDC solution that they were working on. If you've been following CBDC development, it's a pretty basic tokenization example of tokenizing an asset such as a currency and understanding how can global banks and central banks communicate with each other. So this the, the example that I'm bringing up here is the second pilot that SWIFT ran on top of Kaleido, where they were interconnecting um, uh, global banks. So we've had uh, over 12 banks, I believe, here, um, and also interconnecting on-chain data, so based on Ethereum protocols, and also with their internal uh, processing systems. Um, and this is something that I continue hearing from customers is that um, although, you know, tokenization and blockchain bring a lot of new use cases, you still have to integrate them with internal systems. So if you're from the capital markets background, you're probably likely interact already with different asset types. So what we're doing here is that we're tokenizing new asset types and adding it to portfolio, let's say traders and so on. So why do we tokenize assets? So this is a question that comes up quite a bit. You know, for example, you know, do we tokenize real world assets? Should we focus on financial instruments and so, so on and so forth? And typically um, we suggest that you're, that um, whenever you're thinking about which asset to tokenize, you're really looking to um, create inter interoperability between your systems. So you're looking to increase liquidity of these assets and possibly uh, create new financial instruments. So for example, um, there, is a, there is a new trend that's been going on for about 15 years or so of private markets growing um, a lot uh, faster than public markets. So companies tend to stay private longer. It actually creates 
created an acronym SPL. So where um, a company tended to uh, IPO within four years from its formation, now it's taken up to 12. So the funds kind of moved into these private markets. Uh, which presents a really interesting opportunity for folks to tokenize those assets, which brings uh, new standards, brings liquidity to the market, and allows you to have fractional ownership of these assets. Um, it also helps you with improving settlement times. So as a, for example, in the example of tokenized corporate bonds, you're able to get money faster. So by tokenizing and selling those bonds um, at a certain price. So settlement is accelerated versus going through really inefficient um, structure that some of them are currently using and waiting for months, let's say, to take advantage of that liquidity um, and global 24 seven markets. So this is really attractive if you're looking to take advantage of let's say arbitrage opportunities between different markets. So let's say you have a spread between you know Japan and um, US markets that you want to take advantage of. So this 24-7 global market settlement is really attractive to folks. So just to reiterate is we're looking to tokenize assets that could benefit from increased liquidity that are kind of not well defined right now. So bringing more form and standard to this tokenized assets that allows you to, to create new financial instruments or, or not even a financial instruments. There are some uh, tokenization use cases around loyalty port uh, points, um, tickets and so on and so forth. So based on this, we've been building out our um, uh, asset tokenization offerings. Um, it's all based on the open source engine, which I think is really important for business continuity in just helping each other grow. So we are uh, pretty strong believers in open source and uh, working with organizations such as Hyperledger on uh, growing products or uh, projects like Firefly, Besu, and multiple others. So we are building um, integrations for these protocols it, with a high quality chain infrastructure. If you try to run nodes before making sure that they're um, they're up and at the correct block height is really really important for you to kind of know um, if if you're uh, if you have the correct data. Um, we've also uh, are right, right now um, going to be showing you a tokenization platform which allows you to create a new um, asset type uh, by uh, leveraging the smart contract management um, interface. So uh, managing smart contracts that are representation of these tokenized assets is, uh, is something that we've put in a, uh, quite a lot of work into. So a little bit more about the um, our blockchain business cloud, as we call it. So uh, the way we see it is that on-chain activity is only about 10, 15% of the final solution. There's a quite a bit of integrations that need to happen for, uh, for folks to take advantage of tokenization. So for example, thinking about things like custody, how do you manage it? How do you integrate it with the key management systems? What about messaging? Or what about you know queues? And, um, and and the chain infrastructure itself. So we've built this multi-layer platform that allows you not only to manage um, your chain, so you could be using um, any Hyperledger flavor here. So whether this is Besu or Hyperledger Fabric, and on top of this, we've built uh, a middleware layer called Firefly that really simplifies messaging and even takes some of the transactions um, that are typically done on chain, off chain. So this is secure messaging between members of a consortium, let's say, or your trading partners. So really fun um, product, which Nick will be talking about later on. And on top of this stack this really solid foundation, we're building new products. So we have the Institutional Web3 um, asset tokenization platform that really allows you to simplify this integration to um, simplify issuance of new token types um, in management of these smart contracts. We've done the same thing for NFTs. So this is also, also allows you to pin off-chain assets. So in this case, an asset meaning an image, file, or any other digital representation of value. And we are also focusing on consortia. So really simplifying management of, um, of multiple members of your business network. So this is all built on top of the open source technologies and Hyperledger technologies at their core. 
So this is a, a closer look uh, at um, the simplification that we've achieved by using Hyperledger Firefly. Um, I will let Nick jump in here and point out a few things that are uh, gonna be most interesting uh, for the folks on the call. Up, oh, Nick, you're muted. Nick, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, nope, thanks for the thanks for the <laughs> Um, I, I was going to say you could use either slide, but this is fine. Um, what, what you notice very easily on this slide, what you can extrapolate is that there are a lot of things that sit in between your front end application and the blockchain, right? And these are what we call middleware. These are the things like, you know, sort of message buses, for example, or databases or, you know, different Oracle plugins, right? It turns into a long laundry list of, you know, functionality and, you know, sort of integrations that you you need. Firefly acts as that out of the box middleware piece where it's a event driven orchestration model, uh, highly, highly pluggable for things like databases, things like key modules. And it's meant to be this very elegant, very clean integration into your application and into your back office systems as well. It supports different types of messaging, public messaging, right? Blockchain first, broadcast messaging with IPFS, but then organization to organization, private messaging. We can think of the importance of that in all sorts of use cases, supply chain, capital markets, insurance, healthcare, even in gaming or retail and entertainment for that matter, right? And so you start to understand and you start to decompose what goes on chain, what goes off chain, and how you deal with sort of events that your application or organization is going to ingest, right? I've ingested a blockchain signature, a transaction event. I've ingested something that's been broadcast to the network, or I've ingested something that was sent privately to me. So the way you write code against Firefly is really sort of a state machine, right? You, you subscribe to these different APIs with web books or web sockets, and then you, know, you write your own custom business logic about what to do when a certain circumstance happens right there. Uh, Firefly also has a ton of easy buttons inside of it. Uh, it has some of my favorite features such as, you know, turning solidity or, you know, chain code into web two interfaces so that, you know, it's not just the web three savvy developers that can use this system, but it's any, any developer, not even a blockchain developer, right? And so what you'll notice as, as I take you through the demo, and I'll turn it back to you here in a second, Lana, is that your only true requirement when you come to the asset platform or when you come you know, into Firefly is to provide source code, right? To provide some type of chain code or solidity or business logic. And the beautiful thing is that if you wanna leverage some of these really battle hardened token standards, like fungible tokens, non-fungible, hybrid tokens, et cetera, we bake in templates that pull from that open Zeppelin library. So this could be, you know, very, very low barrier of entry to anyone that just wants to get started with digital assets and start understanding how to model, you know, financial instruments, barrels of oil, real estate, et cetera. Uh, so we're huge fans of Firefly, huge fans of all things Hyperledger, um, and we highly, highly encourage folks to, you know, sort of join this community, participate on the Discord, uh, and, you know, maybe even, you know, submit a, a, a good, good first issue pull request. That would be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the, the idea here is that we want folks to participate and bring their um, skills to the table. So, for example, you don't need to know even Solidity in a lot of cases, which is why Firefly is really focused on building APIs. So this is an API forward project to where you can code against those APIs with whichever language that you prefer. Um, Obviously, the data is going to be persisted on chain, and there is a solidity component, which Nick will go over, but the idea is that we want to decouple some of the flows as far as the data goes, you know, messaging that shouldn't be on chain should be on a different um, a persistent layer, which is what Firefly provides. Awesome. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the custody and management. I think this is an interesting point. So if you're looking at the ecosystem, there's been a lot of different custodians that came and went in digital assets. So there are multiple types, right? So we have, we're all are familiar with hot and cold wallets. So hot are the online wallets, cold are the offline ones, but it can be sometimes tricky to figure out 
which asset type deserves which custody, because there are also a lot of cost considerations here as well. Um, so based on this, and because of this, we've decided to be um, not opinionated on which uh, uh, custody solution you plug in, but we've built APIs for you to be able to plug in them anyway. So based on this, we're supporting four different types of custody solutions through um, uh, Firefly integrations. So the first one we offer is, um, is Kaleido hosted wallets. So this is your, you could use either um, either a hosted node wallet, or you can use an HD, which is the hierarchical deterministic wallet um, that allows you to obscure your identity, for example, and allow you to manage um, all of your addresses through a tree. So this one is a lightweight, Kaleido hosted, really robust wallet that allows you to manage your contract, your assets, and different account types. And then if you're moving further to uh, further down the slide, uh, you will notice that we also have cloud service integrations. So some of the cloud providers such as Amazon uh, Web Services do provide services like KMS that you might be using already for key rotation and as a part of your infrastructure. So you can absolutely use that or Azure Key Vault to, um, to provide your custody and key management solutions. And it does work for a certain protocols. So for example, some of the curves on the elliptical curve are now supported. So, that's, um, so those solutions are uh, available. And if you have uh, requirements for HSMs, so this is more of a heavy duty hardware security model Modules that do mean that you are, or are allocating a cluster of hardware modules um, that can be plugged in as well into your um, into your asset platform. So uh, we are supporting um, AWS Cloud HSM as a part of this. But also, if you have your own, let's say, on premises. Um, custody solution or um, or a key management solution, you can also um, uh, plug it in into the platform as long as it's um, a compliant with our standard. And we're also uh, looking at the developments such as MPC. So MPC is a very interesting uh, development that happened over the last few years um, in the way that key management is done through sharding a single key versus having multiple participants sign and approve transactions like you would in a multi-signature scenario. So MPC here allows you to uh, pro provide signing off-chain, which does have some performance benefits. So for example, if the, the if your uh, token doesn't support on chain um, um, multi-signature um, configuration, you could be using um, MPC through providers such as Fireblock, which we've integrated with to provide multi-party computation. And if you have any questions on the trade-offs, let me know. It really depends on the asset type and you know uh, other considerations such as your security posture, um, the frequency of traded assets um, or transactions, and uh, how many folks do you need for approvals. I've personally talked to some uh, capital markets customers that were um, really concerned about how custody is managed within their organizations. So for example, due to um, due to insurance limits, you need to spread your assets between multiple custody providers. So balancing that really made us focus on, well, outside of custody, what else do we need? Well, we need a policy engine, which brings us to a, a policy engine that we've built on um, as a part of the asset platform. And this is, um, I think, a good way to think about the space. So when you're thinking about securing your digital assets after tokenization, you really need to start thinking on multi-layer policy engine and implement it um, as such. So starting from identity management, so really think about how you, you're mapping your web up to or existing identities to on-chain identities, um, services authorization. So for example, who is allowed to issue new assets, who is allowed to, to trade you know, our blocks and kind of control velocity here. So velocity is a term of who's allowed to trade um, uh, and how much of a different asset type. Um, custody management, something we just went over and also transaction management. So if you're um, if you're operating in the regulated space, transaction managing, management is where we uh, typically do a lot of whitelisting of accounts. So let's say who's you're allowed to trade with or not, KYC and other configurations. Also as a part of transaction management, you can set um, you know, retry attempts, 
to make sure that you don't accrue slippage if you're in the trading scenario and you are trading at the kind of the right price point. And obviously all of this uh, integrates all the way to connectors on chain, but as far as we are looking at securing your digital assets, um, we should be thinking about as a multi-layer policy engine that goes from coarse grain to fine grain controls that should be integrated into, um, into your uh, policy um, uh, management systems. Um, so moving on, I will hand it over to Nick in a second, but I really wanted to touch on evolving tokenization standards. So specifically when we're talking about financial assets, there's been a lot of work done between uh, by multiple companies who've done a great job in, in a lot of ways of figuring out how do we uh, tokenize these standards, right? And um, when we're talking about CBDCs, for example, each country is going to create their CBDC based on their own needs. So they're not, are going to have some overlapping uh, features and functionalities, but they're going to also have some divergent ones. So based on this, how do we think about tokenizing assets? Uh, well, the answer is we don't see a clear one answer. Um, we're seeing um, tokenization standards evolving. So something from a fungible protocol, um, a, a, a fungible standard like ERC-20 to ERC-721, which have been made prominent by NFTs, but actually can be extended and do have really nice features if you're looking into financial asset tokenization, down to new security uh, uh, standards that are evolving, such as 1100 series and 400s. Um, these are a little bit more heavyweight standards that do have a level of sophistication to them um, that folks have been working on and uh, open sourcing a lot more. Um, would love to hear from you. So if you want to drop in, in the comments, which talk, token standards you're looking at, uh, we'd love to discuss that and share what we've learned here as well. And uh, compliance. So we all love uh, compliance. Nobody likes being audited. So um, I would say front load any compliance conversations. So we, we've, we've done this um, as a part of building out Kaleido from day one. So SOC, ISO compliance is something that we've built into our platform um, and really think this is the kind of the responsible way to, to, to build in the digital asset space. And this is it from my portion. Please let me know if you have any questions. I'll be lurking in comments and probably interrupting Nick as he's going through the demo. Uh, you'll see our information here. We're on LinkedIn and you can email us anytime. And, um, and yeah, thank you, Nick, over to you. And you're still muted. Still muted. Okay. Well, thank you, Lana. That was great. Um, hopefully I'm unmuted now. Um, so that, that was nice table setting out of Lana there. Um, the, the theme that I'm really going to try to highlight during my portion here is, you know, really around flexibility. So Lana took you through, you know, the full spectrum of key options that you saw available. Well, if you have a different service provider or a different, you know, um, implementation, just let us know, right? We built Firefly, we built this middleware to be inherently, inherently pluggable. So it's not necessarily just what you see on the glass is what you can use. It's not necessarily you have to choose one wallet type, right? And it's one size fits all. It can be multiple wallet types. It can be bespoke integrations. And you can, you know, compartmentalize different asset classes against different wallets, right? Maybe if it's an NFT I don't really care about, I'm cool with, a, you know, a server-side custodied wallet. Maybe if it's a high fidelity financial instrument, I'd like that key that's associated with it to be, you know, in fire blocks behind multi-party compute signature thresholds. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate that similarly with the policies, right? It doesn't have to be one policy that fits all policies for different, you know, asset classes, different smart contracts, different workflows. Um, we're going to spend the majority of the demo today taking you through um, what we refer to as the asset platform. So looking at this top layer up here with a particular emphasis on what Firefly does, the open source Hyperledger project to kind of help make all the all the magic happen. Um, but I do wanna spend a couple minutes down here just on the protocol piece to let you know what Kaleido has been doing for the last six years. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, we support a whole slew of different you know, 
permissioned and public blockchain protocols, uh, including two, you know, really prominent Hyperledger uh, libraries and distros, uh, namely Hyperledger Fabric uh, and Hyperledger Besu. Uh, so I just want to take you through the experience of how that looks on the Kaleido blockchain as a service offering in the event that, you know, you just want a Besu environment or you just want a Fabric environment and maybe you're not ready for, you know, all of this abstraction and the thousand APIs I'm going to show you. Um, so let's just take a quick look at a few of those environments and understand sort of how that manifests on Kaleido. So I'm going to go ahead and log into my Kaleido account. I'm going to probably move this zoom bar 50 times throughout the demo here. And what I did was I just went ahead and created a, a consortium named it Hyperledger 6.7 for the date. And I created two different flavors of environments. I created a BASU with IBFT consensus environment and stood up three nodes inside of here. Uh, and this operation to do, you know, a BASU environment, a fabric environment, or, you know, get Quorum, Corda, Polygon, et cetera. Um, it's a matter of clicking, you know, three buttons inside of the console, and you're going to get your own sovereign permissioned HADR SOC2 compliant, you know, enterprise grade blockchain platform, which has APIs behind it for you to start programming against immediately. So just a quick snapshot of a BASU environment, you know, all sorts of rich experiences directly inside of your runtimes, you know, you have your logs directly available for you, you know, the core node runtime logs, your wallet logs, and then the abstraction logs where we sort of, um, remove the need for you to use a, you know, a client library or an SDK. So just a quick glimpse at, you know, Ethereum. We'll spend more on Solidity, spend more time on Solidity and Ethereum today. So I won't take you through that example, but we will take a peek at Fabric in a bit more detail. So similarly, I've created a Fabric environment on Kaleido. Um, haven't done anything overly fancy. It's using level databases, using raft ordering service. Uh, and I just have a single order, a single peer, uh, and then I have a, a self-signed certificate of Authority that's being managed by Kaleido. Now, the thing I want to point out, it's just as easy to create these runtimes and, you know, we even create a default channel for you out of the box on Fabric. But what's really cool, you'll get this in Ethereum, you'll start seeing this in the asset platform, is we've put abstraction layers into all of the hard things that exist, you know, in blockchain. And that's really kind of the ethos of Kaleido. We want customers regardless of your size, Fortune 50 enterprise to, you know, mom and pop startup, we want you to get to value, meaning we want you to codify business logic, right? Whatever you need to run on chain. We want you to build an app on top of it with a lovely user experience. If you have to spend 80, 70% of your engineering cycles on these very complicated SDKs and very, very esoteric protocols, chances are you're never even going to get to the business logic, right? So we've done things in Fabric like abstracting, you know, interactions with the certificate authority. No need to run a CA client. We've done things like abstracting the ability to send transactions in, right? No need to run an SDK and collect all these different endorsement signatures. Uh, and similarly, we've done the same thing with, you know, subscribing to events or understanding state changes in the network. So no need for you to run your own, you know, polling client or you know, write low-level code to subscribe to events. You simply just tell the system, hey, I care about this type of event and I want it to be delivered to this endpoint or I want it to be ingested by this WebSocket topic. Uh, and we'll see all that in, in real time here. But just to give you an idea, I've already gone ahead and enrolled a user, right? So it's as simple as you know, making a post call to you know, slash identities right here. And here we can see you know, the full MSP portfolio enrollment cert and CA certificate for this user, right? So we have an identity that we can use inside of the system. All right. I've deployed a piece of chain code inside of this environment right here. I just use the basic asset transfer chain code. So we can go into this transactions endpoint right here and we can invoke that chain code, right? So we can use the user that I just looked at right here, user one. Like I said, the system creates a default channel for me. So I don't even have to bother creating channels. And then I have a chain code inside of here, right? On the channel already instantiated called asset transfer. So we'll just go ahead and uh, invoke the method inside of asset transfer. It's called create asset, which we can see right here. So very straightforward method, uh, method just takes five arguments for, uh, I believe it's a marble or some arbitrary object in here, ID, color, size, owner, and appraised value. So just a bunch of strings and integers inside of there. So I think on this notepad right here, I have a little cheat code. So we'll just go ahead and create like asset 03. I think I already created 02 and 01 earlier. 
So let me just paste that in. We'll call this asset 03. Uh, bear with me. We'll make it uh, green. We'll give it a size of one. We'll give it to Tomas and we'll give it a fake value of 10,000 right here. So this is how straightforward it is to just like invoke a smart contract or a piece of chain code uh, using this you know, piece of middleware that's called Fab Connect, which is inside of, uh, inside of Firefly right here. Um, but what we'll see is that rather than having to query a smart contract or rather than me you know, grabbing that transaction ID and calling this path right here, what I can also do is create an event stream and then create a subscription against that object. And what'll happen is Kaleido, Firefly, the asset platform, these libraries, they will dynamically you know, deliver these events to you. So this is one example of how Firefly and the asset platform and you know, Kaleido at large, we see it very much as an event-driven system, right? You're just listening to things that interest your organization, your application, and then you're reacting to it. So whatever is on chain, whatever you could possibly care about, you just create an event listener and a subscription for those state changes. And then you can create, you know, serverless functions, Lambda functions, et cetera, to ingest those and react to those downstream. Uh, very, very straightforward. And we'll see events littered throughout this demo today. Um, so just wanted to spend a few seconds actually showing you the original, you know, not original, it's uh, the, the lower level of the stack, Kaleido blockchain as a service. Uh, and now we'll start moving up the stack and actually take you into the asset platform experience. So um, shocker that this logged me out. Uh, so uh, give me a second, I got to steal a password real quick. Um, sorry about that. So let me log in and we will start sharing again. And meanwhile, I'm trying to answer questions in the chat. So if you have any, just drop them in the chat and we'll try to get to them either during the talk or afterwards. Great. Yeah. Um, and feel free to throw them at me, Ilana, if I can help with any questions. Um, okay. So we are in the asset platform experience right now. We're at the top. We're in that top pancake that we saw on the stack that Lana showed and, and that I showed. And there's six very, very intuitive modules inside of here. You have a landing zone for all of your business logic, right? So this is going to be your source code, whether it's tokens, whether it's, you know, different bespoke, you know, business logic, if this, then that statements. You have Firefly namespaces. So this is where your APIs will get exposed. This is where you'll have the ability to, you know, create those event listeners that I'm talking about to send private data back and forth, et cetera. Uh, you have a whole suite of wallet configurations. Uh, and again, just to reiterate, as I mentioned, you're not limited to one flavor of wallet, right? So even a single user themselves could have a key in seven different wallets, right? If they, if they wanted to, or if you took an HD wallet, you could have, you know, you could use that as your, your runtime wrapper and you could have 10 HD wallets underneath it if you wanted to have wallets for different lines of business, right? Or if you're a gaming company and I want to have a different wallet for every game. Um, we have an entire NFT factory that makes it really, really easy to manage the, the DNA, the metadata of your NFT, uh, and then very elegantly create what we call collections against those, uh, and then programmatically you know, allocate or mint NFTs against those collections. Uh, blockchains, these are exactly what they sound like. This is where you create connectors to public ecosystems um, or to Kaleido hosted you know, private or sidechain blockchains. Uh, and then IPFS, again, could be public, could be a private Kaleido cluster. This is typically where the metadata for an NFT is going to get stored. Um, so I'm going to take you through this journey and I'm going to hopscotch uh, back and forth between um, some, some applications so that you can see sort of how this process works. So I'm going to start by clicking on this builds tab right here and we're going to create a new build. And so um, what, we'll, what we'll notice, and as I mentioned, one example of the easy buttons that we see, you know, in the asset platform and in Kaleido is that you don't have to write code, right? So we can create a token called Hyperledger and we'll give it a symbol called HL right here. This is going to be a non-fungible 721 and we can give it characteristics, right? We can give it parameters, mintable, burnable. I want it to have URI storage. And we see that the code is dynamically built for us. 
And if you're new to Solidity, if this is, you know, sort of, you know, first three to six months of you in the space, you can port this code directly into Remix and you can try to extend it. You can add a new method or you can add a new event. Uh, and then Remix is a wonderful IDE just because it, you know, it'll dynamically compile and lint the code for you and tell you, you know, where you're, where you've gone wrong with your syntax or, you know, your usage of solidity. Um, so really, really straightforward. Uh, we can click next here. Uh, and now I'm going to actually create the compilation. So I can create a new folder, call it HL again right here, add that. Uh, and then we'll just park this build inside of the HL folder right here. Um, so I can create that. And behind the scenes, what's going to happen is Kaleido is running Soul C on our behalf, right? We're running that compiler. We're going to generate that ABI and that bytecode. And it's going to allow us to start doing stuff with it. We can deploy this smart contract onto one of the blockchains that we've connected to. We can generate open APIs. We can start creating event listeners, et cetera. Um, so we'll start by just saying deploy right here as one example. Um, Go ahead and click deploy. You'll notice that there's all these custom actions that are available for you. So, you know, if you want to do, you know, sort of logical naming based on your business or your UUIDs that you guys use, uh, that's perfectly fine. Um, you'll have sort of default entropy generated by Kaleido. Um, so we can see the success of that deployment right there. We can dive into a block explorer to see the transaction. We can see, you know, sort of where all the source came from. But we can also see really, really important low-level details for this transaction as well. So if I go back to um, my sort of landing zone right here, my main page, and I look at our blockchain connectors that we have, uh, and I go to the blockchain that we're hooked into, which is a private BASU IBFT blockchain under the covers, and I go to the transactions, we can see the full life cycle of that you know, ERC721 deployment. And this will start giving you a sense of what Firefly is really doing under the covers. So this is something that you know a C-suite person might like to see, right? Maybe a CTO would want to see more, but you know, just a high-level business person that knows enough about Ethereum and the life cycle of transactions. Just tell me, tell me the main operations that happened and tell me that it got onto the blockchain and that it's good. But if you really are interested in all of the checks and balances and all of the little micro API calls that, that Firefly is making, get past all the binary, we'll see here that it's doing all of the hard Ethereum things on your behalf, right? RLP encoding, sequencing or nonce management, which is a really nasty one. And then the event listening, right? Coming back from the blockchain, from the smart contract to make sure that transaction was properly you know, executed and confirmed. And if you were talking to a public network, you could set different thresholds to say, for example, hey, wait 10 blocks, right? Let, let this guy get nested 10 blocks in before you give me that confirmation operation right there. Um, so just a quick glimpse of like what Firefly does on your behalf inside of here. Um, so that's an example of just using a Kaleido template where developers will ultimately get to is you may start using some of these templates and samples, but you know eventually you'll extend them, you'll have your own proprietary source code, and you can bring it into the system however you want to bring it into the system, right? So run your own VMs, have your own change management system, push it from your machine, push it from a public or private GitHub, uh, all of those are possible as well. Um, so it's not a one size fits all, just like policies, just like keys. Um, before I run out of time, uh, and I'm going to speed up because I want to make sure we can see the applications happening, um, it's worth noting that every single thing, every button you can ever click in Kaleido, inside of Firefly, inside of the asset platform, everything will have an API behind it. So the asset platform API becomes your one-stop shop for all things you would need programming wise. It's your, you know, it's it's your DevOps pipe for all of those CRUD operations of creating namespaces or creating blockchain connectors or smart contracts. But then it's also your programmatic sort of landing zone to talk to the smart contract or, you know, to create event listeners, for example, inside of Firefly or to send private data to, you know, another organization. So this is, you know, when I referred to a thousand APIs, this is, you know, probably probably roughly a thousand with the same authentication schema. So it's again, one-stop shop for kind of all of the programming interfaces that you would need to you know, truly build out a full stack application. Um, we'll come back to the wallets here in just a second. Um, namespaces, we'll dive into the namespace. So I'm not gonna go through the whole ceremony of like how to create a namespace. 
Um, the 22nd version is you need to create a blockchain connector, either to a Kaleido blockchain or a public blockchain, and you need to have an IPFS connector, again, public or private. You take those two objects, those two configurations, and you pipe those into an arbitrarily named namespace, and now you can start doing work with that nice little API surface that, uh, that I just showed you right there. Okay, so let's start taking a look at the apps. This will be more fun. Okay, so what I have here is I have two different applications. I have company one and company two, and we'll look at the mechanics of starting to tokenize some assets, for example, right? So this is going to be a gold bars demo, right? Where in my back office, right, I have a database, I have a portfolio of a bunch of bunch of gold bullion with different serial numbers, different weights, different, you know, geographies, etc. And I want to tokenize those so I can use them as collateral or so that I can do a delivery versus payment or so that I can fractionalize them, for example, right? All sorts of different fun things that you can do with, you know, any asset once it's been digitized. So let's go ahead and add a new one. Uh, apologies for the slack. Um, we'll give it an ID. I'll just say 555 right here. We'll give it a made up weight of 100 pounds. Again, gold bullion right here. Say it's in the USA and I'll just say ABC for the nodes. So this is no blockchain transaction that's happening right here. Okay, this is, um, I may need to log back into this application, sorry. Um, this, is, um, this is just basically mirroring something that's inside of your back office, okay? So again, not creating, a, not creating an asset on the blockchain, but basically putting a one-to-one -one representation of what's in your back office private database into your Firefly private database. Uh, and apologies, I think I need to, I may have this saved on the keyboard right here. Okay, I do. All right, so um, let me start that again and just create um, a new asset right here. So we'll say 444 again, say it's a thousand pounds, it's in the USA and ABC right here. So we can go ahead and add that. Again, not a blockchain transaction, just mirroring what's in your back office right here into your Firefly database. So now we can say, hey, I have an asset right here. I want to do delivery versus payment against this allocation of gold bullion that weighs a thousand pounds. So we can go down to this deliveries tab right here and say, hey, I want to start a new delivery, right? Um, so we'll say six, seven for the date right here. And I'll say it's delivery B, for example. Destination, right? We're running a multi party consortium. And so we have another company that has the entire full stack of infrastructure that I can send private messages to. They have an identity, I can send assets to them. Um, and so this is gonna be sort of the, the first portion of that ceremony where I say, hey, organization number two, I'd like to start doing some business with you with you know this asset right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and start that flow and we'll see some stuff happening, right? Remember, the asset itself has not been tokenized yet. So that's an important step that's going to happen in here. All right. So now the asset itself has been tokenized. Uh, and we're able to see, you know, the actual index inside of the smart contract. We're able to see the blockchain, you know, transaction inside of the Explorer. And we're able to see that, you know, publicly available metadata, right, that I pinned against it right there. How did we get this information, right? This information, just like we saw with Hyperledger Fabric, came back to the application via an event listener. So this is something that I care about, right? I cared about smart contract transactions against this address right here. So this application has a WebSocket client saying, hey, tell me when things happen, right? I wanna know the event back for you know this index right here or this item potency key that I've passed in. Um, so that's an example of events coming back to the app right there. So now what we need to do is we need to use Hyperledger uh, Firefly's private messaging rails. We need to talk to organization two and say, hey, in return for, you know, this thousand pounds of gold bullion, I would like, you know, a million fungible coins, right? A million USD, right? A, a stable coin that's pegged to, you know, fiat currency right there. So I'm going to send a private message to the second organization saying, hey, do you agree on a thousand pounds of gold for, you know, a million stable coins? And organization two can come in here. We have, we have a few of these on sort of like auto accept and they can say, yes, I do accept that right there. And after they accept it, they'll push their fungible coins into that escrow smart contract. The, you know, initiating party pushes their NFT into that escrow smart contract. And then if this is a real world delivery versus payment, you also have the ability to say, 
hey, I'm not going to actually invoke the smart contract and unlock my assets until those gold bullion bars are in my vault right here, or until, you know, I have the deed to that piece of real estate, or, you know, until the cargo container came off the ship and, you know, my signatures on that bill of lading or customs document. Um, so you can put these, these thresholds in there. And then ultimately what happens is after you've confirmed receipt of the real world item, both parties here, this is using a settlement contract under the covers, both parties are going to call an approved method inside of this settlement smart contract right here. And it's basically going to unlock the counterpart's asset so that they can extract it. So this will in turn, uh, if I go back to the app, sorry, this will in turn provide, you know, the token identity, right? The NFT, the gold bullion to company number two. And in return, right, this person gets $100,000, not a not a million dollars. I missed a zero right there. So a very, very straightforward, but also powerful example of delivery versus payment. How do we marry on-chain logic with off-chain logic? Uh, and how do we sort of start implementing, you know, different classes of smart contracts without having to you know, spend all of our engineering cycles understanding how to talk to that smart contract, right? And so this open API interface for just speaking web two, but having it translate to web three can be really, really powerful and an incredible accelerator um, for you know, a lot of different use cases and you know, a lot of different types of developers. So that's DVP. Let's go ahead and create um, another gold bar right here. I was going to say 666, but let's say 777 instead. Uh, we'll say this one's 900 pounds. This one's in Europe and XYZ are the notes right here. I'll just go ahead and immediately mint this one, but I wanted to show sort of the, the two ways that, you know, an application can, you know, or the, or the asset platform can, you know, say, hey, just mirror an asset for me or actually create that digital asset for me immediately. Um, and now inside the app, we see, hey, I can do some more stuff with this, right? I can move it. So let's think about a scenario where, you know, maybe we want to leverage a gas-free sidechain to do millions of transactions at, you know, high throughput at very, very little cost. But every once in a while, we're going to have a real high value NFT, and we want that to exist onto a public network, for example. So the asset platform in Kaleido supports a trusted bridge, right? where all you need to have is just a connector, a namespace, right, which is the nomenclature, into a different type of network, a public network or another private network. You would supply these three parameters, right, namespace, token pool, which is the indexing service, and then the address of the identity that you want to receive it. And again, this will bridge private to private, public to public, private to public, whatever, what have you right there. So very straightforward to just, you know, cross blockchains to move these assets. Um, even more straightforward to move the asset within the same blockchain. Fractionalized, this is quite an interesting one. Um, this uses a example of a vault contract that we have. So say we want to add, you know, more divisibility or fungibility to that thousand pounds of gold bullion right there, right? I want to turn them into, you know, very easily spendable fungible tokens. So uh, maybe we'll say, um, I don't know, we'll call this one Kaleido, for example, and KAL and say, hey, I want to turn those however many pounds I said into, you know, a thousand, right? I want to divide it by a thousand right there. And so what this will do is this will actually pass ownership of the NFT to the vault contract. And then, you know, a thousand was passed to the constructor inside of there. Uh, and now we have, you know, a new pool of tokens that we're able to spend or transfer uh, that are representative, you know, of that NFT, but now way more divisible. And so I can click this transfer button and I can move that add attachment. This is also another example of, you know, hey, I have some rich information associated with this digital asset, but, you know, it shouldn't be public to all or it doesn't belong on the blockchain. So you can arbitrarily add, you know, any form data, right, to a smart contract or to a, uh, to a digital asset inside of the system. Uh, and then you can choose to move that attached data arbitrarily if someone requests it, if someone purchases it, purchases it if someone's entitled to it, et cetera. Um, or you could just broadcast that data to the network and allow everyone to pull it down from IPFS, right? Tons of different ways to deal with on-chain, off-chain, uh, public data, private data. Um, so that's a kind of a whirlwind tour through um, 
I guess a, a few example applications that you know sit on top of the asset platform service right here. Um, of course, we can follow any of these hyperlinks, and these will take us directly kind of into the asset platform experience. So we can go see you know the actual you know mint operation or the transfer operation. Um, I think I have to click this one twice actually. Um, so this will take us you know into the actual method that we invoked on that 721 smart contract. This can bit, get exposed you know completely publicly to your consortium you can put OAuth in front of this and have this as like sort of a quasi public block explorer or this can be just a completely private block explorer that's you know only accessible to you know sys admins that are inside of the organization um, you have tons of flexibility on this service we call this kbi right here uh Kaleido blockchain indexer um, so that's one example. This token pool is another really important example of, you know, sort of how the system, you know, keeps track of your information. Uh, so a token pool, what it is, is um, it's an indexing service for, you know, specific smart contracts and specific interfaces. So you can say, hey, create a token pool for me for this, you know, gold bullion NFT smart contract right here and start listening on block number 50,000, for example. And what it'll do is it'll, you know, start at that block number and it'll replay every transaction. It'll show you balances. It'll show you transfer, mint, burn, approve operations. So you have, you know, granular visibility into whatever data that you need inside of that smart contract. You could extrapolate that same information just coding against, you know, the different event interfaces. Um, but this is, you know, kind of a convenience function because, you know, this this means that you don't even have to run like a, you know, a API endpoint or a WebSocket client. You can just call this API, uh, and then you can scrape whatever information you want off of it. So conscious that we're running a little low on time, let me spend a few minutes on the wallets and a few minutes on the NFTs, and then uh, we'll see if there's any questions here. Um, so I'll spend just one minute on the wallets. Like Lana said, right, whole suite of wallets. If you have a requirement, get in touch with us and let us know. We can talk about sort of the commercial and engineering lift to bring, you know, another vendor into this ecosystem or, you know, a bespoke configuration inside of there. Um, but the short answer is you can have as many, many different wallets as you want. And like I said, inside the HD wallets, you can have, you know, as many actual wallet runtimes as you want as well. Now, one lovely um, sort of convenience feature inside of here is sort of the life cycle of these keys. So we can easily add and delete new keys. So we'll create one for Tomas right here, Tomas one. And you have full flexibility over kind of the naming conventions, right? This can be an email address. This can be a unique identifier. This can be first name, last name, right? Whatever someone's logging into your OAuth system with, this is typically kind of the syntax that you would paste against this URI right here. So we can add that key. And now when I'm calling the smart contract, I don't have to call it with the public address. I can actually call it with this sort of syntax right here, meaning your application starts getting smarter and starts getting more automated. It's Nick Gasky that logged into the system, signed the transaction on his behalf with slash key slash Nick Gasky, for example, right? So very, very intuitive if you add users um, or need to offboard users. And again, API underneath this. So if someone comes in and they don't have a key, programmatically create a key for them. Super straightforward. Um, I did mention I would show the NFTs super quickly. So let me just jump in here. Um, I'm going to switch to company one right here, their view of the world. So we can go to templates. Templates are the DNA of the NFT, right? So think of this as you structuring the metadata. These are the files that you're reading in. These are, you know, the different parameters that'll be nested in the JSON object, et cetera. These can be as simple or as sophisticated as you need them to be. Uh, once you've created, yep. Now, I was just going to point out, we had a question earlier about, you know, the asset types that are supported within the platform. This is how you would define it. So essentially you can import the different template types and define your asset per your use case. So um, it's not opinionated as far as, you know, asset types that we support. Yeah, completely unopinionated. Just takes an arbitrary JSON or YAML object right here where you enumerate those parameters. Uh, and then you can even, you know, click this parse button and it'll show you a, a preview of what, you know, that template that you've created, what the out, you know, the outbound asset would look like right there. Um, we have one with robots. So I'll just, I'll use that today for you guys. Um, and again, 
you could have hundreds of these, thousands of these, millions of these, right? So, you know, as your designers add new different, you know, artifacts into your portfolio, as you, you know, have new pieces of real estate come in, as you have a new financial instrument, et cetera, et cetera, you just programmatically create new templates. Uh, and what you'll notice here is that everything can just get automated, right? The end-to-end -end journey of you, you know, deploying a smart contract or adding in new NFT DNA uh, is, is really just as simple is getting familiar with this API surface right here um, that we already looked at. So last thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to go into this collection that I have called Robot Examples right here. Um, I've created a few already, and I'm going to just create another one. So I'm going to create it against this robots template. Uh, I'm going to choose an image, which is just an uh, example robot right here. Uh, and again, this is an example of where you can just store as many sort of off-chain files as you want, right? This is hanging out in your private database. So, you know, this can be, you know, financial information, stock certificates, KYC information, you know, pictures of real estate, um, what have you. So we could say robot four. Uh, and, and now this allocate to field, this, this is where if you're a developer, you can sort of really, really close the loop and get to the end of the journey. Rather than minting this asset directly, what we can do just the same way that we created those keys and the syntax inside of the HD wallet. So we can just allocate this to, you know, an alias that someone's going to use to log into your application tier. And then they will have the ability to say, oh, cool, I got a, got a new wallet. I got a new asset in my wallet because I, you know, passed this certification, right? Or I, you know, I, I earned this new digital asset because I did X, Y, Z, right? Or, whatever circumstance takes place. Uh, and it, um, yep. Sorry, we had a question on off-chain data storage. So how do you configure it based on your requirements? For example, S3 versus, you know, other solutions. Yeah, so the databases themselves are completely sovereign to this stack, right? So when, when we say a stack, right, this is a dedicated VM. This is like completely firewalled runtimes. Um, all of the different pods and containers in there uh, are, are solely part of your organization for your organization. One of the many things you get in there is a Postgres database. Uh, there's a Postgres for the state of Firefly. Uh, there's a Postgres for your private data. Um, but that private database, right, can be swapped out for a custom database or a cloud services database, something like an S3 or something like uh, Azure Blob container. So if that's already your landing zone for existing assets, rather than kind of, you know, making an unnecessary API call to mirror that data into Postgres, instead you can just integrate that database kind of into your asset platform experience. Uh, Kaleido won't persist that data, but will provide you the messaging rails and the pipes for you to move that data to other participants. So um, in reality, what could happen is I could have an asset platform stack with an S3 integration. Lana could have an asset platform stack with an Azure Blob integration. And the only thing that's happening inside of kind of the Kaleido guts and the Kaleido infrastructure is that data is flowing via Apache Kafka from my S3 to Lana's Azure Blob container. Uh, and then based on the application, the business logic, et cetera, someone purchases purchases it, requests it, proves that they're entitled to it, et cetera, you can arbitrarily you know, send them that data. Um, so we're not you know, prescriptive on when you should use what, we are, you know, again, I'll use the term flexible. We wanna delegate um, and allow customers to use as much of their existing cloud estate and back office infrastructure as possible. Um, robot type, I'm just gonna say metal, and then I'm gonna say one, two, three here, just cause we're, I'm already over on time right here. Uh, so we'll generate a picture of this guy. I'll create the NFT. Um, and again, I haven't minted the NFT, but what I've done is I've pushed it into user one's wallet. So if I go to, I think this is the application for user one, we're gonna find out real quickly. Um, but if I go into this wallet right here for this user, um, okay, already logged in. Uh, let's try this again. Continue. Um, give me, give me one second. I got to copy the password. But th this will be the end of the demo. Um, that's that's really uh, that's really sort of the flow right there of you know sort of simplifying interaction with the smart contract um, and you know being able to understand when you need to do a blockchain first transaction versus sort of a, what we'll call a lazy mint or an allocation transaction. 
Um, so let me again log out of the admin, log in as user one, user one right here. And if we go into here, doesn't like my password. Um, but we can see that now I have robot four, that off chain NFT object that I created inside of the wallet. And now as a user, I have the ability to, you know, claim and mint this, right? And so I can say, hey, I want to claim and mint this thing into the wallet that I already have. Or, you know, maybe I want to use a MetaMask wallet, or maybe I want to use a different type of wallet. So again, this, this allows you to sort of deal with digital assets at scale. Not everything has to happen on the blockchain as soon as you want to create an asset. It can be delegated to users. You can pre-populate wallets with digital assets. You can do airdrops, uh, a whole slew of flexibility that's available here so uh, it just gives you an idea yeah go ahead please Norman. yeah um and i was just saying that there's practical ap application for this development pattern so number one minimizing cost um and number two is like really understanding of when you want to mint assets so for example we worked with a company called, called green fence on a kroger use case where we um minted uh coupons that could be dropped in folks' wallets that might not have a bank account. So lots of cool applications. Yeah, for sure. And last thing, and again, thanks for giving us the extra time, Tomash. Um, we are an enterprise company, right? And so everything that we do is going to go through the cavity search, the infosec departments of banks, insurance companies, healthcare companies. Um, so all of the different runtimes that are inside of the asset platform, inside of the stack right there, as a system admin, you know, as a you know keeper of the keys type for your company, you will be able to customize your own view of these different pods of their consumption of CPU of their usage, and this can be for runtimes. This can be specific on the blockchain. Uh, this is every view that you could possibly need sitting here inside of this you know Grafana Loki experience for user logs. You know what's happening inside of your tenant, what's happening on your blockchain, what's the health of your transactions, uh, and you know. I imagine enough folks are familiar with Grafana. You can you can customize the views, you know, sort of however you see fit right there. Um, but this gives you a sense of like, you know, what's actually running in the background, which is uh, a whole bunch of things right there. Um, so I'll call it quits with the demo right there. I think I showed most everything I wanted to see, but um, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to let Lana put back up our contact information. Um, and if you think, you know, any of the infrastructure you saw today, whether it's blockchain as a service, whether it's the middleware component of Firefly, or whether it's some of the value add stuff that we put on top of it, you know, would be valuable to your company, regardless of what stage you're at, uh, reach out and get in touch with us, right? We're, we're happy to have a non non aggressive conversation. We can go as technical as you want, or as business oriented as you want. Um, we're again in the business of wanting companies to get applications out the door, get them from POC to pilot to MVP to production. And you know, again, our thesis is trying to lower that barrier of entry while still using very sophisticated enterprise grade technologies. Um, and so we love this space and we'd, we'd love to talk to you. And again, huge fans of open source and Firefly. So um, incredible. Thanks to everyone for, for sticking to the end of the call, even though I'm probably 10 minutes over at this point. And big thanks to Ben and Tomas for uh, helping, uh, helping facilitate this. And, and huge thanks to Lana for sharing her expertise on financial services and capital markets. Well, that's been really great. Uh, thank you so much, Nick. Also very cool robots. Uh, and um, <clears throat> thank you, Lana. Uh, thank you both a lot for uh, sharing this interesting information. Uh, for anybody that wants to get in contact with uh, Kaleido, these slides that um, Nick and Lana were presenting will also be available uh, on our webinar library, just in case you haven't managed to you know, grab them uh, from here. And uh, you're also welcome to reach out to us and reach out to Kaleido team as well they're uh, very helpful very responsive so i'm sure uh, you will get um, your response quite uh, quickly um, and thank you of course everybody for joining us now uh, just before we leave i uh, just wanted to <clears throat> invite you to join our hyperledger discord uh, we have a lot of real-time interaction there you can also uh, explore the channel related to fly firefly um, and also to other projects as well 
We also have some other upcoming webinars. Uh, so on Wednesday, June 21st, we will be uh, hosting a webinar about the Universal Digital Payment Network um, um, done by our member Red Day Technology and their uh, partner GFT. And then just a week later, we will be hosting a webinar from Infosys about driving uh, process transformation in public sector services using blockchain. And I would uh, invite you to uh, join us there as well. There are going to be exciting webinars uh, as well. Uh, please go to our event, event website to register. Now, thank you again, everyone, for watching. And thank you so much uh, to Kaleido team. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Lana. It was a very informative presentation. And I can also see from the comments that our attendees have enjoyed it uh, a lot as well. Uh, and as mentioned, just feel free to check back on our YouTube and our webinar library, where we will be sharing both slides as well as this video. Uh, thank you, everybody, and have a nice day. Thanks, folks.